It's great to welcome back to the program today, Car Corey. <laughs> In, I, in my focus to say his last name correctly, I almost called him Carrie Corey Doctorow, who is a science fiction author, activist, journalist and blogger. His latest book is Choke Point Capitalism, how big tech and big content captured creative labor markets and how we'll win them back. Particularly interesting now in the context of all of the concerns around tools like chat GPT and AI and the impact that they may have on creative labor markets. Uh, maybe just to start somewhere, Corey, we start there. What's mm. your sense? Very big disruption coming from these tools or maybe overblown? You know, I, I think that um, as interesting as the hypotheticals about what will happen when these markets mature and start taking away jobs from creators yeah. uh, can be to think about, it's pretty speculative. Um, there, there are elements of what GPT does that, and other ML tools. I don't like calling them artificial intelligence. They're neither artificial nor intelligence. Uh, but these machine learning tools, they're also not learning. <laughs> but <laughs> what they do, what they do, uh, sometimes amounts to something that I think is um, absolutely legitimate and the kind of thing we want to encourage, which is thinking really hard analytically about how art is made and then making new art. That's how I became a writer. Uh, and, you know, uh, irrespective of what tool you use to make your art, uh, it will always include some element of automation and always include some element of analysis. And making something new by analyzing the things that came before you, it that is not just legitimate, it's how art emerges. And, you know, one of the things that we've learned and that Choke Point Capitalism tries to emphasize is that when you have um, an enormous amount of market concentration, Right. There's there's five giant publishers, four giant studios, three giant labels, two giant ad tech companies, one giant ebook and audiobook company that that giving exclusive rights to creators is not a way to get them paid more. It's like giving bully kids extra lunch money. You know, if you have to do a deal with one of those companies to go live, then they're just going to take whatever you've got. And so, you know, not long ago, there were a slew of music lawsuits over kind of look and feel or groove of songs. The first one was a lawsuit over the song Blurred Lines that argued that it just sounded like a Marvin Gaye song. Yes. Not that there was any notes from a Marvin Gaye song, rhythm from Marvin Gaye song, lyrics from Marvin Gaye song, code, ch you know, uh, uh, key changes or or chord progressions, but that it just in its totality sounded Marvin Gaye-ish. And um, the victory in this lawsuit was kind of a, uh, uh, heralded in a mixed way by both by record industry executives and by performers. Um, but ultimately, I think you know, with three giant record labels. Uh, if it does turn out to be the case that there is such a thing as a groove right and that becomes well established in law, it's just going to become a feature of the normal record deal that when you sign a record deal, you sign away your groove rights. And what that means is that whole genres will become the property of three companies and there's just going to be no way to make new art without submitting to whatever terms they demand of you. That would be the worst case scenario of creating a new right to control how people can make new art out of what they've learned from looking at your art. Now there's a much easier case, which is the plagiarism case. Yes. Right? That's where that's where machine learning just coughs up whole sentences, paragraphs, images, figures from, from other art. That's a lot easier. That's just copyright infringement uh, in, in the main. Um, but I think that even if they could guard against that and, and as a kind of pretend computer scientist have an honorary doctorate in computer science, um, I, I can imagine a pretty easy way to compare uh, uh, output from a machine learning system to training data from the system and ask yourself, is, is this a direct lift? And if it is, then you then you um, uh, discard it and start over. And I think that even if that were happening, all of the concerns that people have about creative labor markets would, would still persist with machine learning images, uh, um, words, and so on. If we step back a little from the creative side and content creators and talk a little more generally, on the one hand, there are more and more ways in which c computing generally, and by this we might be in mobile devices, computing generally is kind of integrated in, in every aspect of people's lives, jobs, shopping, travel, you know, quite literally every aspect of people's mm -hmm. lives. There is a maybe a growing realization from some about the power that big tech has, both in terms of guiding people's choices and in terms of data in all sorts of different ways. There's a growing realization. I don't know that it's really completely widespread un uh, and understood in the way that maybe someone like you would would hope people would mm -hmm. understand. 
what is the direction of this in terms of what where this is taking us as a, as a five, 10 or 15 year timeline? Yeah, you know, there's a kind of galaxy brain meme version of this, right, where, you know, first you have this inkling that some computer technology, some digitized element of your life is adversely affecting you. Yes. Right. And that it should be better. Then you realize, oh, well, this is pervasive across all of society. Then you see some muscular action taken in one corner and you see it ripple out across all these other areas in unexpected ways. So, for example, um, you know, the copyright notice and takedown system that was created in 1998 in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act really changed the way that we do copyright enforcement for the digital era. You know, when I worked at a bookstore, if you thought a book on the shelf infringed your copyright, you didn't just get to march in and say, take it down. Right. Right. You'd have to, like, get an injunction and show evidence. And if it was frivolous, you'd face penalties. Now, under notice and takedown, you literally just send a, a, an email to uh, any of the intermediaries. Right. So it can be a payment processor. It can be a cloud provider. It can be the ultimate application provider like uh, YouTube. It might even be an application, uh, an application conduit like the App Store or the Google Play Store. And you just say, there's some infringing material here. You need to take it down. And by and large, that's what happens. That turns out to have all kinds of weird consequences, right? You get cops who play Taylor Swift songs when people try to video record them in the hopes that YouTube's copyright filter will automatically remove the content. Yeah. You get uh, reputation management companies that are really just reputation laundry companies. Uh, there's one in Spain that's quite notorious that works for convicted torturers, murderers, human rights abusers, war criminals, and it uses fake copyright notices to make news articles about their crimes disappear from the internet. You know, and so this is the next stage where you're like, oh wait, we need to do this with care. And then, you know, for me, the galaxy brain stage, the part where you get to the where you go, oh wait, there's like a way through this, is to say that. Um, all of the impediments to making good evidence-based policy about tech do not stem from regulators merely being a little clueless about technology. Regulators are capable of acquiring a clue about technology. There's no microbiologist in Congress, and yet we all manage to drink our tap water without dying of microbial illnesses. Um, but rather that when an industry is very concentrated, you know, when the web is five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four, it's very hard to have a, an uncaptured regulator. Every time you try to do a proceeding, everybody who shows up from industry tells the same story, even if that story isn't true. And you get kind of twisted and distorted regulation that redounds to the benefit of those firms. And that's why we need to demonopolize the Internet. And that's when you realize, oh, wait, Google is not a company that's an idea factory. Google is a company that uh, buys other companies that have good ideas. Google itself has made one and a half successful products. It made a search engine and a Hotmail clone. Everything else it's made, it bought from someone else or just copied from someone else like Chrome, uh, which is based on some open source code, uh, abandoned by Apple, ironically. Um, and and uh, you know the the um, uh, you know the the products that it launched internally, Google Video, Google Plus, and so on. These all just crashed and burned. It 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 hasn't made a success in house. So you know if we were to apply antitrust laws as they were written instead of as they've been practiced for the last 40 years and just say you can't buy your nascent competitors, you can't merge with major competitors, you can't acquire vertical monopolies, you can't collude with your competitors to rig markets as Google and Facebook have done with their Jedi Blue program to steal money from publishers, you know, they're not stealing your copyrights, they're just stealing your money. Uh, th that um, you know, if we were to apply those laws, then we would have a very different technology landscape. And a lot of these problems could be much more narrowly focused. We could say to a company that's doing something wrong, hey, this is your conduct remedy. Here's how to, you have to change your, your, your ways and, and clean up your act rather than creating these, these policies that ripple out through uh, these individual companies that control so much of our lives. So if we step back for a second from the antitrust and sort of regulatory piece of this, at the individual level, is this just like the ship has sailed in terms of like unless you are quite literally going to opt out of using devices, leaving any footprint on the Internet? It's just sort of like, yeah, I don't know, like using a VPN is not really going to make a big difference here. Like, is, is there anything that individual behavior even has as a role to play here? So I think that the, that in, that we need to talk about monopoly again to talk about the role of individuals, because one of the things that made monopoly possible was this ideology of consumerism mm. and this idea that it, you that the way that we make the world a better place is by shopping carefully, that your political participation amounts to being an ambulatory wallet. 
Uh, you aren't going to shop your way out of monopoly capitalism, but you never were going to shop in a way that would prevent monopoly capitalism. You know, if you go down the grocery aisle uh, and um, you pick up the product that is a low packaging alternative because you care about the environment to some yeah. major product, it's going to be made by the same company that makes the high packaging alternative. It's going to be made by one of two companies, Unilever or Procter & Gamble, the two companies that make almost everything in the grocery store. Uh, and um, if there was a product that was successful against them, if there was like some local like uh, dude in a leather apron who was making hipster cookies and uh, everyone was buying them and they became a runaway success, uh, either Procter & Gamble or Unilever would buy him out. Yeah. When they did, they'd issue a press release that said, we bought this company because we know our customers value choice, right? Well, you, you you can have any choice you want except for the choice not to enrich the companies that are doing bad things, which means that there is no choice for cleaning up society. To clean up society, you have to be part of a movement. Um, systemic problems need systemic solutions. The second half of choke point capitalism is a bunch of shovel-ready solutions that are quite technical and have no individual role um, except for the role of making these part of the ideas that are lying around when crisis strikes, because when uh, things that can't go on forever will eventually stop. And when they do, there is the space in which ideas that have been in the air about how we can make contracts fairer, how we can make business fairer, how can we give uh, individuals, performers and workers more rights, that's when they come to the fore. So, you know, for years, people have been talking about what we lost when unionization went away. Um, as an individual, you can't improve the conditions of the workers at your Starbucks. But when 100 Starbucks move to unionize because that idea is in the air, because the crisis is struck, then you as an individual have a role to support the union. They'll tell you how. They'll say, here's our strike fund. Here's the day that we don't want you to, you know, we don't want you to buy Starbucks um, uh, gift cards this Christmas. You know, they they will give you ways that you can act as an individual as uh, to enhance the the action of a movement. But in the meantime, what you can do is, is find out what the systemic problems are, um, talk about and socialize those systemic solutions, and then be ready to deploy them when the moment comes. Aside or in addition to the monopoly and antitrust issues, what else are the big, big tech concerns to you in terms of, you know, funneling people into a uniculture or whatever? Right. I mean, I'll, I'll just leave it open. What else should we sure. be concerned about? So, you know, I wrote another book uh, that also has the word capitalism in the title. It's the season for those books <laughs> called How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism. Yes. And and it argues with Shoshana Zuboff and her book uh, in the age of surveillance capitalism, whose core hypothesis is basically that ad tech is a kind of mind control ray. And that uh, while it might have been invented to sell your your nephew fidget spinners, it's been hijacked to make your uncle a QAnon. Uh, and that's where all of this collapse and our support for our institutions comes from. It comes from the persuasive power of ad tech. I don't think that's true. I think that, you know, ad tech companies, their their greatest persuasive power is convincing people to buy ads. And that's always been the ad industry's greatest power. Mm. But I do think that people's uh, um, confidence in our institutions has collapsed because our institutions are are not worthy of our confidence. Right. When the NIH lets Moderna uh, um, make uh, an mRNA vaccine using NIH patents without taking a license and then doesn't step in to assert that patent when Moderna quadruples the cost right? Uh, and, uh, and uh, scoops up for itself a 4,000% margin on this vaccine that was produced with $10 billion in public money, that that, that is a reason to doubt the, our institutions and that monopolies pervert our institutions. And so, you know, to the extent that ad tech helps you find people who are disillusioned. It doesn't make those people disillusioned. And the way that ad tech makes people disillusioned is by abusing our rights, not by being persuasive, but by, for example, effectively blocking privacy regulation, which we still don't have on a national basis in the United States. I, I think in a world where we are, our privacy is so comprehensively invaded so frequently and so uh, uh, visibly, when our regulators don't step in to give us a privacy regulation, then that that makes the claims of conspiratorialists who say that our, our agencies are captured, shouldn't be trusted and so on, it makes them credible, not because Bill Gates is putting microchips in our vaccines, but because the agencies themselves haven't earned our trust. So that's, I think, the main problem of, of big tech is that big tech makes the claims of conspiratorialists credible, which makes it harder for us to rebuild our institutions, which we really need to do. Lastly, Corey, you know, you you are so well known for issuing these 
extraordinarily important critiques of the system out of sheer curiosity. Do you do anything at the individual level that people might find interesting? Like you, you stick with an old flip phone just to, yeah, or, you know, no. anything like that? No, you know, like this is the thing. So I'm not, I guess the biggest thing is that I'm a Zucker vegan. I don't have any Facebook accounts or Facebook adjacent accounts. I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on WhatsApp. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not okay. on Facebook messenger, but you know, that doesn't help at least, uh, or except at the very margins, because Facebook still has a dossier on me. All right. the apps on my phone are built with Facebook SDKs, which means that uh, they're gathering data for Facebook uh, and 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 Facebook is maintaining it. Um, you know, I, I there are only so many hours in the day. Yes. And I am pursuing systemic changes, right? And so if I stop pursuing systemic changes to pursue individual ones, then I, I'm going to lose efficacy. There's a great bit at the end of Zephyr Teachout's wonderful book, Break Em Up, about antitrust, where she says, if if you spend three hours driving around looking for fair trade mom and pop magic markers to yes. make a sign so that you can go to the strike against Amazon and you miss the strike because you didn't want to buy your markers from Amazon, Amazon wins. Yes. Right. And so uh, rather than taking these meaningless individual steps at the margins, I try to take um, uh, big step, big swings at the center. Uh, you know, that said, like with arts, artistic work, um, I, I try to buy it in the way that gives the artist the most money. So with music, that means when there's an artist I love, like most recently it was Penelope Scott. I go and buy their whole catalog on Bandcamp, which does give significantly more money to the artist than listening to them on Spotify. Uh, OK, interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I I agree with you wholeheartedly about the broader broader philosophy there. Um, the latest book is Choke Point Capitalism, How Big Tech and Big Content Captured Creative Labor Markets and How We'll Win Them Back. We've been speaking with the book's author, Corey Doctorow. Always great having you on. Really appreciate it. Likewise, it's a it's a great pleasure. Nice to see you again, David.